friends, how are you? Today, Jeremy is joining us. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself, your childhood, your family. My name is Jeremy Reiser. I'm from West Virginia. Um, I was a single child, kind of, um, from a family. My parents were divorced when I was really young. So I have some siblings that are like a half brother and a stepsister and the other side a stepsister, but she was a lot older. So I was raised kind of a single child. And I was raised Lutheran. And my family, my mother's side of my family, I went to church every Sunday. I had a, there was a strong faith given. I knew who God was pretty well. Um, not enough, but um, I definitely was given faith as a child. It was given to me. So you went to school, then on to high school. What were those years like? Did you have a relationship with God? Did he play a role in your life during your teens? Okay, so my my mother always took me. We always went to church every Sunday. Um, and I started drinking some when I was in junior high and then in high school. And But she would still, if I was home, I was going to church. And I don't know if she knew or not. Um, but I felt penitent when I went to church on Sunday and that like the hangover, the suffering. I would go and I actually could feel God's, now I know it was His mercy and His grace, but I wasn't sure, I just knew it was right. Back then I knew it was right. Why did you start to drink? How did you fall into that vice? What led you to... Um, I think for sure it was, you know, it really started around junior high and it probably started with, okay, the culture was kind of lax some. and. For sure there was plenty of other people doing it, but I can't really blame any of that. It was, I think I got into it because I hung out with a girl one night and I could see that I was looser. I was um, not, not dwelling as much in my own low self-esteem or worried about sticking my foot in my mouth around her. So it absolutely had to do with you know, relationships with the opposite sex. Absolutely, 100%, I realized. And, and, you know, maybe feeling less than or something. Because on the outside, I was an athlete and a, a good student. I, you know, by the time I graduated, I graduated with honors. And uh, there was a point in high school, though, when I broke up with my girlfriend, and this really kind of is a, a pivotal moment that I see that I used alcohol before I ever touched drugs that I used alcohol for um, to cope pain in my life. We split up, something had happened, and I, I remember drinking every day for 90 days. Just beer during the week and then live up to my obligations and study and, and actually was, even my grades were increasing, it wasn't enough to show my dysfunction yet. And but on the weekends, like a lot of whiskey or something. And, and at some point I knew, like in that, I knew that I had done that. I knew that I had used that to not feel. You know, at that point I knew for sure between those things. What age were you when you started taking drugs? 17, 17, yeah. And your relationship with God? Did you feel his presence when you were drinking or taking drugs or when you were trying to escape from all that pain that you were experiencing? Because before you said that you felt penitent. So would you say that the Lord was present in your life? Okay. Well, so I still dated the same girl, like went back to that and went to college. And I went to college. Uh, I walked on to play football at West Virginia University. And... Um, I made a goal for myself when I lived in the dorm that year to read the Bible. Like I was going to read, it had that in there where you can read it in a year. Like if you read certain verses or certain parts of chapters and I'm going to do this. You know, and I'd first moved away from home and I stopped. There was a, a good Lutheran parish on the, on the campus as well. And I didn't go. I think I went once with my older cousin who, who drugged me there and that was it. You know, I, I, Tried to play catch up for a little while. I'd go in and try to read like a whole chapter in Genesis, which is, you know, 19 years old, 18. That's difficult. 
And, you know, especially if your heart's not completely in the right place. And I still struggle to, to read religious and spiritual material. I need to, and I still really struggle. I was praying about it today. But it definitely, I, I, can, I remember that, like being something pivotal as well as a bad moment or hurting. And I started drinking all the time. I was playing ball and, and, and drinking. And, you know, so I still knew who God was. You know, after that, over the next few years, it probably became more like I would go to church when I went home for the holidays or just sometimes when I was randomly there. And and it was trench prayers after that, you know, just please help me here and there, you know, and probably asking for the wrong thing and the wrong person was answering. From drinking, you went on to taking drugs. How did that come about? How did you go from one thing to the next? For me, I think, you know, with most of my friends, like the, the ages they got into drugs, I think it seems like I was a little bit later because um, I was right around 21 and I quit playing football. I just made the decision to quit. I was starting into my third season uh, and I was doing good and I had really good grades again I was you know with honors um, but at some point I started really making drug addict decisions before I was you know like this um, so that relationship finally like ended it was off and on for two years of high school and two years of college and it was rocky and it was I was probably more clinging I was looking to be loved I definitely had like um, some sort of issue with not being able to be in a, a proper person in a relationship at that point you know I'm still trying to learn how to do that right and um, you know I think that happened and then I just walked in and and said right before the summer practice started I'm just my heart's not in this give it to someone else and that was something that I regretted you know um, you know, um, at that point, I think I still wanted to try and be a, a state trooper, and I was still thinking of things like that, but then something didn't work out with that, and I was drinking, and I had started taking steroids because I saw myself getting weaker. I didn't take them when I was playing ball, and I made, that was one of my justifications to myself, was, well, I'm not gonna take steroids, and I either have to do that now, or I'm not getting anywhere. And then nine months later or six months later, I was taking them because I saw myself, even though I was working just as hard, I didn't have all those other people around me who were pushing and trying as good. And that, that push and that, so even though I was doing it, I, I lost strength and weight. And so then I did that. And I only did it for like six weeks, but I kept drinking. And I saw myself almost having some, 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 rage type things happened like you know that were that were really bad but I did stop because I thought to myself if I can't I can't take steroids and drink at the same time because it'll destroy my liver so still some little thought thing in there it was like okay well I have to stop taking the steroids because I'm not going to stop drinking and then within a few months I I think one month for for a few months I was smoking weed and then, and drinking with it. And then all of a sudden, one month I went and I tried um, Xanax for the first time. I did cocaine three times in one week and I, I did heroin, like all that within a month and the cocaine and the heroin all within a week of each other. And I still graduated, I still finished. And then I went to law school and I kind of got asked not to come back. And then I went and worked on my master's and I did everything but finished the thesis and had like a 3.7 but never finished. And all that, I was just avoiding life. I was drinking and doing drugs and, and I was lost in, the thing that I've learned the most now is lost in like an immaturity. I've been praying to God a lot lately to make me more mature when I see myself getting mad at work and stomping inside of a bulldozer and maybe cussing, you know, and struggling with those things and really get mad at myself because I think that reflects the child 
in me that just didn't want to grow up and still I'm having to fight with, even though God has come into my life and, and really, it was obvious what he did for me. Why did you become so aggressive when you started taking drugs? Why were you so angry? Was it because of the drugs? Or was it something else inside of you? I never felt good enough. For sure that's what it was on the outside. I was capable. I had accomplished things. Like, the things I did try to do, I could do. But I didn't quite work hard enough. Like with football, I didn't quite work hard enough. And I think those things ate at me inside, like about laziness. Even sitting here talking to you, I thought about something like, what was one of the biggest regrets of my life? Not letting my mom teach me piano from a young age, which I really could use now. So it was laziness. And I knew that. And I think that, and you know, just, just, always feeling awkward. If I was the kid who, if I thought I was gonna run into that table because a girl smiled at me, I was gonna run into the table because I thought of it. So it's really possible that that was gonna happen. It actually happened to me uh, helping the priest serve a mass with the Carmelite nuns in, in Loretto, Italy. I thought, my elbow's gonna hit that, the wine. And it hit the wine <laughs> before he consecrated it and spilled it and I thought, wow, that's really, but then I, I think about other things too with like what else is going around us going around us that that influences us and but but so that's what it is. It's definitely like feeling um, inferior. Feeling inferior. But then maybe not working hard enough for something or how long did this go on for? Um so I started using drugs then around just as I was turning 21. And so then 15 years, I, I would, something would come good in my life. Maybe I'd get another opportunity and I'd mess that up uh, some way or another. And just perpetually would not grow up and didn't like myself for it, but couldn't get myself out of it. Could not, could not. But God did because he knew. Sometimes, sometimes he just kind of hits me in the head with stuff now and I see it like if he shares a joke with me. A couple of my big aha, like really big moments of, of, of the relationship with him forming have happened in like, aha, ha, God, okay, and then, oh, wait a minute. But there was a couple that were really hurt, really hurt too. And I'll say what happened. My sister had found out about Chinocolo. Community Chinoclo, founded by Mother Vera in Italy uh, for drug addicts, I think 35 years ago now or 36, I'm not sure what anniversary we're on. But she was the only Catholic in my family and she was praying in uh, Columbus, Ohio and a couple of nuns saw her crying and lighting candles, which is the only thing I really understood about Catholics, you know, besides watching Rudy, maybe. and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, so they told her about Avira, and they told her about Chinocolo, and they told her about Bishop Baker, and they told her about some things. But I, was, I just went to rehab, and I came out, and I was, oh, it's, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to be fine. I will say one thing that was really huge. She sent me um, one of the precious medals of St. Michael and a little pamphlet about him. And so when I came out of rehab, for the first time in my life, I actually prayed to a saint, and I wasn't Catholic yet. And still, I struggled for a long time to even do that after. But I, I asked him something, like, help me be a warrior like you. And you know, you're thinking something like crazy, like watching movies, you know. Like, but I didn't know that he was gonna be along on this journey with me. So you found out about Chinacolo? Yes, and uh, I didn't, you know, so those kind of things happened, but I still went back into the darkness. I still went back into the darkness for, uh, I got clean for like five months and then I went back and, and completely dark. And I went as far as you could go with those things, with drugs and stealing from my family, everything that there could be. But what happened when I finally went, when there was no other options and I'd been, kicked out of recovery houses and rehab programs and 
My mother and my sister hadn't given up and I called her. And the ball started rolling. And it took a while to get in, maybe another month or so after we started asking. Because at my age, it's, it was something where they don't know if they can get you to change. How old are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm 42 now, but I was 35. And so when that happens, they're not sure. I mean, you spend that many years, it's really difficult to change. And you have to show some sort of like desire that you want to do it. But I, I was still kind of trying to fool my family. But when the day came that we did come down, you know, I fought and my mom brought me all the way from Orlando International to St. Augustine. And less than a mile from, from community, I said, no, I'm not going. Took me back to the airport, turned the car in, was gonna leave. I mean, this is how much the immaturity and the, like, um, and the whole time I was trying to get back to another girl that I'd gotten lost with, you know, and that was just as bad getting over as the drugs. That was just as bad of like, and a, a, something inside that was immature and holding on to me. And so we were on our way back to the airport and we were close. And I had this thought, just a voice. I didn't hear it, I felt it. If you do this, you will die to me. That was the voice. Um, you know, I took a long time trying to figure that out later because I still went to the airport and still fought. And then at the last minute, I called someone who was trying to help me get into Chinoclo. And she said, don't get on a plane. And my mom got another car and dropped me off there that night. But I still fought even after God spoke to me. I didn't know for a long time that was the Holy Spirit. I was trying to figure that out, you know. But I felt him say that. And it was like I was in turmoil and chaos, like and torn up, dope sick, which is a horrible way to be. And you just you're just so frustrated and gone. You can't really concentrate on any ideas except something that's bad. But I felt peace. And that second that that voice came, I felt peace. And he wasn't saying it like he was saying it in a way like he was disappointed that he was gonna lose me. So that, that was the moment that, for sure when I got back to the airport, made me talk to someone else and go. And so after that, you know, it was a struggle for a long time, but I would say some of the things that really helped change who I am and, and made me wanna convert fairly quickly to Catholicism. One is, God took me there. So why would he take me there if that's not what he really wanted from me? And I mean, there's people who have went and didn't, but it was me, I know he wanted that. And I know now it was because of what he was gonna ask of me in the Catholic Church, how many more people I can be part of something with and he can use me to get people to him with one big church that's the same all over the world. You know, so I know that, but we did, um, we did a Stations of the Cross at the Eucharistic Congress here, and, and I had to beg with like, someone asked me to do a novena. And, and I had started going in the chapel, and I went, and we started doing a novena. And we were doing just little ones that are like, you know, like a paragraph, but it was just to get me in there. And then we found this Mother Teresa novena. And so this is the second time I prayed to a saint. This little pamphlet. And I just started praying that with them. And I was praying like a bunch of prayers out of the Pieta and other stuff too and taking like 45 minutes to do it and being like, it's beautiful, but that's not who I am and how I need most of the time now. It, it formed me, it helped. But I realized for me, I have a short attention span sometimes and only love on God for like a minute at a time. And so I need something a little shorter, but like really, powerful and the graces that I received from praying and asking for her help and um, you know the relationship that I formed with the Holy Spirit at that time is definitely something that like it drives me it drives me now when did you decide that you had to become a Catholic that you had to stop being who you were and leave behind your other life was there a certain moment well, leaving that life came way before. It, I, I think I just, I thought I was gonna die that way. I thought I had to die that way, I thought I deserved to, I thought I was destined to. The girls that I was with, 
I, I was with them and I thought we deserve, you know, it was, it was terrible. I put that on them in my heart too. Um, at some point with that, I was planning on, the reason God spoke to me that one day is because I was planning on doing something horrible to make sure that I was gone. Um, do you mean that you wanted to commit suicide? I was going to do death by cop. That was my, I'm going to go in a pharmacy and get drugs and they're going to kill me. I'm going to make them kill me. That was one of those, that's a horrible thing. Because then you're, you're going to put that on someone else's soul. They don't want to shoot you, you know. But, I, but that's, that's how far gone I was and how unable to like, I just couldn't live life. I couldn't live life. And, but something in me, like God used when my sister found Chinocolo, he just used it. And there was that little bit. And the first couple months were so hard. I couldn't sleep at all. I mean, it was, um, you know, there was a priest standing there for an experience and he was praying over me in my sleep because of the stuff he saw me like, going through. And, um, you know, it, it was something, there was a lot of little stuff that happened this this like long, big moment. Chinoclo, I was there for over five years. And so it's a really big, long, but it's not, you know, it's also like it's, it was the hardest thing in the world and the easiest at the same time. And so there was a moment when I knew for sure, I'd already told them that I wanted to become Catholic. I didn't know yet they were going to do it, but we went to Assisi from Loretto and it was actually my mother's birthday. So I was praying for her and I was praying and my big moment there happened in, in uh, Claire's church. Um, we went in and we prayed for like 10 minutes. It was the first time we kind of got to kneel and just be calm for a minute um, and pray. We'd already done mass in St. Stephen's Church. And so we were there praying in front of the, the, the cross that Francis carried through the streets. And so and I really like older things like that too. But I mean, I, I, so here's the third time. But it's Michael again that I prayed there. And I prayed for him to help me protect me. You know, I don't know what I was asking. Protect me. And um, I went down to Claire's tomb, and I came up, and I was kind of feeling really, I already had tears in my eyes. I can do that. Like, God can take me and fill me up with, like, ready to cry pretty easy. Now, I have to ask him to choke it back for me when I'm singing. But um, So I walked up out of her tomb, and I'm feeling that way a little bit, and I stopped at the top of the steps, and I was like, I, I took a breath just where I stopped, just... You know, and I'm standing there with my eyes closed for a second, and I felt the sun move over me. And I thought, aha, there was the aha, there's the funny, aha, God, you know, I'm going to stand here, and the sunlight's going to hit me because the cloud moved out of the way, and you're going to make me think something. And something said, look at the window. Just look, I'm not kidding. And I looked, and what I saw which may not have been what was there, I don't know to this day, one of the three windows up at the top, coming out in the big part of the big church, I saw the shield, with the, like, like the Catholic church, the sign of the cross. And when we got back to Loretto, they told me, listen, you're going to, uh, you're going to go to Saluzzo for the Easter Vigil, you're going to become Catholic. I don't know. Ask for protection see the Catholic shield, and then somebody tells me I'm going to become Catholic, and I think, the shield. <laughs> I don't know. Those are some of the, like, some of the moments. But, you know, I guess Chinocolo really taught me just to pay attention more. To pay attention more to everything, because you don't know where he's speaking to you from. I don't know what he's saying. I don't know. And a lot of the time, I put myself in the way, I put things in the way. I put, you know, foul language in the way or I listen to the wrong music and I do things and I, I scar my relationship for a few minutes with God. And it's not that he's scarred from it. He just wants me to not do whatever it is that I'm taking myself away from him. But I learned that stuff there. And I would say all these moments with, you know, the help that I've had that were big, like supernatural type things were because I'm stubborn and he needed me to know to pay attention. You were already baptized, but what was that moment like when you entered the church? 
when you could receive the sacraments and especially the Eucharist? I think that, okay, so it was a big celebration with 20 or 30 people receiving different sacraments and, and even in, in community, you know, it's, it's always just, it's still kind of an old school thing, even the slap in the face, you know. Um, I think more, it was a big celebration and it meant something to me, but I think more what I take from your question, I think about like how I have to keep pursuing and refining, trying to do the right thing with like confession. Because I remember then, so I'm making a lifetime confession, and afterwards I just remember feeling like all the time like I missed something. Like I didn't confess something, or I didn't do it good enough, or, and I wondered that a lot. Now I know I was forgiven for everything in the past, if it came back to me and I need to do it, but I, and confess it again, but I think more, it, it just reminds me how much I need to pay attention and make sure that I go do that. Like that's what, I, I feel so blessed to be able to go to confession because sometimes like I just feel like crying from the mercy that I receive in that moment and the grace. Also when I take communion, when I say those words before, sometimes I choke. I mean, I, I mean, because if you're really thinking about that and you're really, if you're really thinking about what you're doing, like that's, it's simple, but it's not. What words? Um, oh Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Like that's an invitation. That's an invitation. What advice would you give? Because we can see that you are totally transformed. What would you say to someone who is watching right now and is in a similar situation to yours, in a world of darkness, sin, and addiction? What would you say to them? There's got to be some way to introduce all of them to God because most of them probably never knew Him or most of them don't feel that He loves them. They don't, they don't understand who He really is, but they also don't understand that you have to make an effort too. Like it's, it's not just... God's going to do everything and we just pray and we get what we want. Like, it requires so much of an effort. I mean, he had to send me somewhere to take care of it because I was so incapable. If somebody could allow themselves to be helped, no matter how much they're against any kind of faith or anything, I think if they really want to heal, it's going to take a while. They need to be away from everything in the world as long as they can. And it needs to be faith-based. That's the absolute best way to do it. For me, it's the way it worked. For me, nothing else would have worked because there are beautiful things out there like Alcoholics Anonymous, but one of the things they say is people who are incapable of being honest with themselves and drug addicts, we lie to ourselves more than we lie to anyone else. I mean, you know what's wrong and you know those things are wrong with you, but to get a relationship with God, it, it's going to take being away for a lot of them would have to be like away from just so far removed from the life they're in. And they say that, they've been hearing that for years and years and years, but everybody seems to go right back to where they were at. And it doesn't take long. Usually it doesn't take long. So for me, it's it was forming a real, real profound and deep relationship for, with God where I do at least look for Him in things because like I said before, I fight so much not to, you know, sometimes I don't even fight. I just use foul language or I'm mad in traffic and everybody's in my way. And it's like, they're not really. That's just me being selfish and immature. And, and I had to fight that. And then I'm, and it's ugly. And I mean, those are just some of the things or, you know, lust or anything. I mean, it's just so much. And so it's, they have to go somewhere where they can form a real relationship with God and be taught by people and surrounded by people who, who know something about God and want to talk about God. Because you're going to talk about all that other stuff too. But you're cursing yourself with it if you don't talk about God and what He can do for you and the, and the, the beauty of the relationship you can have with Him. But you're not going to have one if you don't do something about it. Jeremy, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. We are so happy that our Lord entered your life and completely transformed you because you look like a completely different person. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, Jeremy. The Lord transforms us. The Lord forgives us. The Lord is merciful. 
and he brings us from darkness to light. We have to discover that light, and we can do so with the help of Our Lady. But we have to make an effort. Let's not stay in the darkness just because we want to be comfortable. Search for the light. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.